All right, we've got both our speakers here. My name's Adam Woldowski. I'm an engineer from the New York office, and I'm delighted to welcome you here. I, I'm going to tell you something that's not strictly true. Um, I'm a big fan of pair programming, which is true. So I wanted to get a uh, book with two authors here so I could invite, uh, invite them and, and get an example of pair speaking. But, well, you know, they, they say open with a joke. It doesn't always work. <laughs> anyway, uh, without further ado, I give you uh, David Henderson and Charlie Hooper. Thank you. Well, I guess I should try my pair joke. I had a girlfriend years ago, and I'd say to her, do you want a pair? And she said, no, I'll just have one. <laughs> oh, well. This is the book, Making Great Decisions in Business and Life. I'm uh, an economics professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. I'm also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. My colleague, Charlie Hooper, uh, was one of my star students at Santa Clara University, quite close to here, 27 years ago. So that's our little background. The phrase, work smarter, not harder, has been repeatedly ridiculed in the Dilbert comic strip, not because it's a bad idea, but because it's thrown as, a, as a, a brick to drowning employees. To tell someone to work smarter is like telling him to be happier, healthier, or wealthier. wealthier. It's not much help just to repeat the objective. What you need is means of achieving the objective. Our aim today, and our aim in our book, is to help you achieve your objectives. Our, our, we write, wrote the book to help those in business and those in the business of life, in other words, everyone, to make better decisions. What we offer is both simple and powerful, a better way to look at the world based on techniques we've either discovered or learned from reading other literature. Who here has ever driven through the corn country of Iowa or Nebraska? All right. When you go and you, you, you just drive through it, from a certain angle, what you see is this jumbled mass. But then when you get to a certain place, you look down and you see these completely straight rows. Well, our book is the book to help you see through the corn cornfield of life. That once you apply these techniques, you find that some very apparently complicated problems can actually turn out to be relatively simple. And Charlie's going to start with one. So if you've ever seen the cover of our book, and if you haven't, just look up on the screen. My brother, Douglas, uh, took this photograph. In addition to um, doing work like this, he also does fine art photography and wedding photography. And I know this might be surprising that um, I'm actually related to somebody with talent, but it's true. <laughs> and one of the weddings Douglas was photographing years ago was at the Stanford Faculty Club. And he was preparing to photograph the remaining elements of the wedding. And that included the garter toss and the bouquet toss and the cutting of the cake. So he went over and talked to the wedding couple. And he said, you know, here's how I'd like to do it. Here's the steps I'd like to go through. And they said, well, that sounds great. But we're not going to be here. He said, what? You know, this is your wedding. You're the wedding couple. Where are you going? And they said, well, you know, we thought we'd be done by now. So um, you know, we scheduled a limousine to come pick us up. And uh, as soon as the driver shows up, we're going to leave. And that's because he's going to charge us a fine of a dollar a minute if we don't leave right then. So think about this. They've planned for years for this event. They spent tens of thousands of dollars. They've invited hundreds of people to their wedding. And they're going to leave early, before they finish their, their wedding reception, to avoid paying a fine of a dollar a minute. I mean, what were they thinking? And maybe they weren't thinking. Now, if they thought about it a little bit differently, maybe they would have come to a different conclusion. So somebody could have come up to them and said, you've already got the mariachi band, the DJ, all the food, the drinks, everybody's happy. We could just extend your wedding for a dollar a minute. You know, we could extend it for an hour for a mere $60, which is a small fraction of what they'd already paid. Or maybe somebody could have said, well, let's just pass the hat around and collect money from everybody and just leave the limous limousine driver sitting out there for an hour, they would have had to collect 27 cents from everybody at the wedding 
to, to make this party go an hour longer. Um, the other thing is maybe they could have called the limousine driver and rescheduled. Um, and they also didn't have to leave right when the driver showed up. Maybe they could have delayed it 15 or 20 minutes to photograph some of those things and then left. So had they thought about it differently, they might have come to, to a different conclusion. And now I want to tell another story from, from my life. I call this story Saving My Father's Life. I grew up in Canada, and I've been in the United States for virtually the whole of my adult life. In 1988, I got a call from my cousin in Winnipeg, that's near where my father lives in Canada, lived in Canada, and, there was, and he said my father was suddenly in the hospital, and there was something about his tone that made me wonder if he wasn't telling me something. I called the doctor, and finally I managed to drag out of the doctor that my father had purposely taken an overdose of sleeping pills. And I was puzzled, I didn't understand why. I had talked to him two weeks earlier, and he seemed to be doing fine. What had happened? So my next call was to the airline, and I went up to see my father. On the way up, I had a very ambitious plan. It was to try to talk him out of committing suicide. But I realized there are steps in that plan. The first one is to understand what happened. What had changed in two weeks that he had done this? Because if I didn't understand what happened, why he was the way he was, I couldn't do anything. So when I got there, I found out that he'd had these pains in his legs. He'd had polio during World War II. Maybe there was a connection. And he couldn't imagine life without using his legs. He was a very active man. He was 78 years old. He bicycled 20 to 30 miles a day still. He could not imagine life without his legs. So then the question I asked was, what if you could have some kind of surgery so that you could use your legs again? Would you want to live? And he said, well, of course. And I said, OK, well, then that's the question we need to answer. Is there a surgery? So I go and find the doctor. It's a small hospital, a small town in Manitoba. I find the doctor in five minutes. And I find out, yes, there is a surgery, which, by the way, is something my father had not even thought to ask. Now, as I said, it's in Canada. So there's a little, there's a little hitch here. In Canada, they have socialized medicine, which means everyone lines up. You have to wait for surgery. You have to get on a waiting list. And so the doctor said, yes, there's a surgery, but your father isn't in serious enough shape to be at the top of the waiting list, so it might be months or years. So I told my father both pieces of news, got him happy about the first piece of news, there's a surgery, unhappy about the second piece. And he said, I don't know if I can wait months or years. Well, then there was a new thought. There's this country south of here <laughs> where you can actually pay for health care. And you don't have to line up. So I told him, I bet you for 20000 this is in $1988, we can get surgery that will fix it. I'll come up next week and drive, weekend, drive you down to Grand Forks or Fargo, and we got it nailed. My father says, yeah, but 20000 you know, that'll reduce the amount I have to leave to you and your sister. I mean, he's got this house that's paid for. His retirement income exceeds his expenditures, even with him giving us generous amounts of money every year. And he's worried about, you know, the estate being 20000 less. And I said, I think, certainly speaking for myself, I can handle without the extra 10. Um, so I talked him into it. And I had to walk him through that reasoning. And by the way, this is the one thing you'll notice. When you start applying these principles, and I'll get to the principles in a minute, I had to walk him through the reasoning again and again through the weekend until by the end he could recite the reasoning to me. Because people get stuck in the old ways. People get sunk. And you need to keep pushing. It's easy in the sense that it's simple to apply these principles. It's not necessarily easy psychologically. But by the end of the weekend, I talked him into it. and then. The kind of good news, in a sense, was the situation got worse. He went to the top of the list and got his surgery in Canada a week later. So now, from Charlie's story and my story, certain principles emerge. Think back to the wedding. What were they telling themselves? They were saying, I must. We must leave at 5 o'clock. Well, there was a, a, a novelist who, who wrote a, a novel in which one of the characters says, the only things I have to do in life, the only thing I have to do in life is die. You know, everything else is a choice. So there are all these things we tell ourselves we must do that we mustn't do. They didn't have to leave at five. 
Second one, think on the margin. They've put all of this money into this wedding. They've planned it for months. People have spent, and we show a little calculation in the book, people have probably spent $60,000 on the whole wedding. And the marginal cost of having an extra hour of this wedding is $60. Do you think that might be below the marginal benefit? Create better alternatives. And Charlie talked about some of the alternatives, what you could do. You could hand out the hat. You could do all these things. In my father's case, the alternative to suicide was surgery. That's creating a better one. And then if he couldn't get a surgery in Canada, the alternative was to have it in the United States. And think about what matters in both cases. The wedding, what matters? 60 years from now, if they have a good wedding, and by the way, they're not starting really well here, <laughs> will they look back and say, Gee, I'm so glad we saved that 60 bucks. Even with compounding, you're not talking huge numbers. And so those are, you know, those are some of the principles that emerge from those two stories. And what we're going to talk about next is some of the other principles. So ask what changed, think value, think arbitrage, know what you want before you choose, and biases affect the best of us. Now, ask what change is actually a very good principle for clear thinking. And I'm going to tell you a statement, and you're going to tell me what's wrong with it, OK? Fewer people are attending Major League Baseball games this year because baseball is boring. <laughs> I think he's got it. OK. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's always been boring. OK, well, if you think it's always been boring, then it's still boring this year. If you think it was exciting last year, it's probably exciting this year. Nothing's changed. I mean, baseball hasn't changed. Maybe there's different players in action, and there was a strike or something. But just saying that doesn't explain anything because it hasn't changed. So I want to give another example. I wrote a piece in the San Francisco Chronicle back in 1999. At the time, gasoline prices had gone up in California by about 40 cents a gallon. And if you looked at what had happened to the price of crude in that same time, it had gone up. It, it, the price of a barrel would translate into only 10 cents of that increase. So why the other 30 cent increase? Well, people's favorite explanations, and there were people writing editorials saying this, was that the oil companies were greedy, that that was the explanation. Now, you're laughing. Why? Right, because they're always greedy, right? And by the way, that doesn't distinguish oil companies from drug companies or Google, right? I mean, that, their, their goal is to make money. Now, Google does give a lot of stuff away, and thank you very much for that. I mean, you've changed my life in a positive way. But the point is that companies are out to make money. So there was no change in greed. And in fact, if you had the greed explanation, notice how weird an explanation would be. Go to the pump, it's two cents less. Ooh, they became a little less greedy. Go to the pump, 10 cents more. Ooh, they got a little more greedy. Uh-uh. And in fact, what I pointed out was there have been these refinery, fin refinery fires in California that meant there was less supply. And usually, you'd have arbitrage, which we'll talk about a little later, where you would have fuel coming in from other parts of the country. But because of EPA regs, fuel burned here can't, isn't produced elsewhere. We've got to have special, a special blend. So the ask what changed thing really applies to that. Another alternative, another op, uh, principle is going to show oh, you. Right? Okay. Yeah, is um, that to create better alternatives. And this is my pillow story. In fact, we almost called this book, but it was too inside a joke: hard heads and soft pillows. My wife, daughter, and I were in Phoenix in 1994, and we were spending six days there over the Thanksgiving week. We woke up the first morning, and our necks ached, especially my wife's and my necks ached. And we realized it was these really hard pillows. So we had five more days in front of us. So we called around to all these hotels and found out we could get a, a different hotel. We'd pay at least $40 more a night, which is $200 more. To us, that was a lot of money in those days. And then we thought, what I think you're thinking. <laughs> right. And it was, wait a minute. Our problem is not with the hotel room. It's with the pillows. So let's look into pillows. So we went down to Sears on a Sunday morning. I lay down on the floor trying out all these pillows, got the top of the line pillows for 30 bucks each, 90 bucks. Even if we gave them away, we were better off. And in fact, we figured out how to scrunch them into our suitcase. And so we created a better alternative. Come up with, you know, buy new pillows, because that's what was bothering us. So we've told this story to a number of people. And just like happened here, people go, ooh, 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 ooh. 
buy new pillows. And they say it as if the solution is obvious. But is it obvious? And what we found is most of the time it isn't obvious to most people. And it wasn't obvious to Lance Armstrong. Now, as everybody knows, he's the only time, only seven-time winner of the Tour de France bike race. And in his book, It's Not About the Bike, he complains about the hotels he stayed in and the food he was served as he raced and trained throughout Europe. Quote, some of the motels we stayed in made Motel 6 look pretty nice. There were crumbs on the bare floors, hairs in the bed sheets. To me, the meat was mysterious, the pasta was soggy, and the coffee tasted like brown water. Sounds like he was having a good time, huh? Now consider for a minute that Armstrong lives in a $2.5 million mansion on a riverbank. He lives in Austin, Texas, not Mountain View, California. <laughs> he drives a Porsche. And at the time this was written, he was making $2 million a year. Couldn't he buy his own pillows? Couldn't he stay at better hotels or eat at better restaurants or give his cook more money to buy better groceries? So for perhaps a few thousand dollars extra a year, Armstrong could have been comfortable while he was earning his millions. So it certainly wasn't obvious to Armstrong. That's a good point. So you can't even get your own groceries, or you can get your own groceries. You can have your own book, but you cannot have your. You cannot choose the hotel where you stay. Really? They Still? Your, they, they choose the for you. Yeah. Well, guess what? Well, get your name and. Give you a little footnote in the second edition. It's a little less. Well, but he still could have gotten. Could have got be a better, better coffee, coke, right? Or better groceries. <laughs> yeah, better coffee, right? The, 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 he bring the coffee with him. You saw it in the last chronicles. He has a little pot of coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think this is not about the book was written before, you know, kind of earlier in his career. But that's yeah. a very good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I want to get to another principle. If you could show our little principles again. Oh, principles. Uh, yeah. Um, Think value. Think about what's value. And one of the things I want to highlight in this is the value of time. And by the way, every story we tell in the book is a true story unless we say otherwise. And in the book, we say, hey, we're making the story up. But 95% of the stories are true. And if they aren't, we say so. And this is a true story. A friend of mine, an, an, an economist, invited a Nobel Prize winning economist to his school to give a lecture. And my friend went to pick him up at his hotel. And the economist, and, and they were running a little late as it was, and they had to go to the president of the university's house for a nice dinner, a little socializing, and then the talk. And when he picked him up, this Nobel Prize winning economist said, I've got this just raging headache. And my friend says, OK, let's stop in the little drugstore in the lobby of the hotel. Get you, get you some aspirin. So they look at the aspirin, and this economist says, $4.95 a bottle? At home, I pay $2.50. Let's go to another drugstore. <laughs> My friend was looking at his watch and saying, he, he figures out a solution. I'm going to make up a name. This isn't the name, because I promised I would never tell the name. <laughs> this is your lucky day, Gunter. <laughs> um, I'm going to buy you the aspirin. Now, do you notice anything ironic about that story, given that it was about a Nobel Prize winning economist? He should have been the one to point that out. And by the way, I don't want to dump too much on him. In fact, there's another point to make, which is that we can all do it. We can all make these mistakes. I brought a novel up here to read last night, and uh, I noticed it's overdue two days ago. And I thought, 25 cents a day, you know? I think I can handle that, you know? Why, why do a side trip to the library on the way up here? So think value. Another one is think arbitrage. In our lives, there are often arbitrage opportunities that present themselves. Well, sometimes they don't present themselves. Sometimes you have to notice them. And again, I want to tell a story of a colleague of mine who's since retired named Pat Parker who, when he was 17, did this. He was sailing off Long Island. And this was in the late 40s. And he was just thinking about things. His father was in the minerals industry, was in mining. 
So things like prices of minerals were discussed around the dinner table. We had just got out of the Second World War. The price controls on all these things had come off. And the price of, le of lead had shot up. He realized he was sitting on a lead keel. And when he did the math, he figured out his lead keel was worth more than he paid for the whole boat. So he pulled the lead keel off, took it to a lead dealer, sold it, so put an iron keel on the boat, did full disclosure, revealed to the buyer that it's an iron, it won't be as good, sold that boat, and thought, wait a minute, I can do that again. So he bought another one and did it, another one and did it. He did a whole bunch of them during the summer, this 17-year-old kid. He arbitraged. He moved resources from lower valued uses to higher valued uses, kind of like using unused time at the NASA airfield, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and which was great, by the way. I don't know why people are dumping on that. Um, and I was at his retirement party, and I reminisced about this story. And I'd never heard him tell how much money he'd made doing this. This is in 1948. He made $20,000 in 1948 dollars. That was you know, triple the, the median income of a family in those days. Do you want to adjust oh. it for inflation? Or? Uh, yeah, I did that. What would you do? 20,000 is like uh, 200,000, I think. I think it was Somewhere like 300. 300,000. 300,000 today's dollars, yeah. So nice money. Um, and you. OK, thanks, David. Um, now, what is the main measure of success for any business? I'm sorry? ROI. Yeah, and profitability, right? Profitability. OK, so I, I'm a consultant. Sorry. Um, so how successful would I be if I came in Google and said, I've got this great idea. Let's increase profits. <laughs> OK, I'm gone. I wouldn't get very far, right? And that's because this is like the brick lifesaver that David mentioned in the beginning. You know, you're throwing a brick lifesaver to somebody you know, grab onto this. It's like, it doesn't help because all we're doing is repeating the objective. We're not actually helping you achieve that objective. So people who thought about this, they've, they've realized, yeah, I can't go in and just tell them to increase their profits. I need to do something more. So they think, okay, now what are profits? Now profits are revenues minus expenses. Well, I'll tell them to reduce their expenses. Yeah, that's a good idea. Reduce your expenses. Well, what am I going to tell them about revenues? Okay, well, revenues. See, how do you get revenues? Well, you have good you know, products and services, and your customers like them, and they buy them, and they're happy. And they just went down this sequence of kind of logical steps, and they ended up with the thing we've all heard, which is treat the customer as if the customer is always right. So I don't know if you've ever seen, you know, some people have posters up on their office wall, and it's rule, business rules. Well, number one, the customer is always right. Number two, if the customer is wrong, see rule number one. This is kind of ingrained in our society. And when I worked at Syntex in Palo Alto years ago, the HR people thought that we needed to be better with customer service. So they told us the following story. This older woman walks in a Nordstrom store and says, I've got four car tires that I don't want anymore, and I'd like to return them. Well, Nordstrom's doesn't sell car tires, and Nordstrom's doesn't sell any automotive equipment. Nordstrom's is a prestigious retailer of fine women's and men's clothing with very good customer service and a great returns policy. Well, now, the question is, is what did the uh, clerk do? Well, in true to form, you know, she's a quintessential Nordstrom clerk, clerk, so she took the car tires and gave the woman a store credit. <laughs> but now we have to ask the question, is the customer always right? I mean, is it possible that they're wrong? And what I'd like to do is tell a story from my business. And uh, my company is Objective Insights. So when we get projects, we try to provide objective insights. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, had this project with a small, young uh, company. And they developed a novel formulation of a corticosteroid. Now, corticosteroids aren't new. And many of you have applied one to your skin for dermatitis or psoriasis. It's normally like a cream or a salve. But this company had developed a novel formulation. They were very excited about it. And the CEO reasoned that the market in this country for corticosteroids was $630 million a year back then. 
So he thought, if our product is so good, we should be able to get $200 million of that at peak revenues. So he said, okay, sounds like an interesting project. We took it on and we really looked into it, as we always do, and we came up with objective insights. <laughs> this is not an ad, by the way. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> so, so uh, but one of the insights that we came up with was that this product was exciting because it was a novel formulation, but that also meant that it was um, pigeonholed into a very small subset of the market. So when we went and presented our results to the management team and the CEO, our objective insights, we told them that the peak sales for this product wouldn't be 200 million like they thought, it would be goal 17 million. Well, the CEO wasn't very happy about this and he yelled at us and then he kicked us out of the boardroom. And I think it goes without saying, goodbye client, goodbye future business. And they never called us back. Now, years later this product did launch and we tracked its history and we looked at how, how much it sold. And whenever we present a forecast for a new product, we present a probabilistic range. Now, our midpoint of that range was 8% too low. So the product did a little bit better than we thought. So here's, here's our estimate. The product did a little bit better, but the CEO's estimate was 1,000% too high. So I would say that we had better objective insights than he had. Um, now, years later, when he realized that we were right and that we presented objective insights, you know, I would have thought that he would have sent flowers or something, but it never quite happened. <laughs> So now the question is, was this customer happy? No, certainly not. Did we do the right thing? Yes, we did, and we've since done it other times. Because if we kowtow to a customer's unreasonable expectations, we cease, well, we, we lose our reputation and we cease providing a service, a valuable service to our reasonable customers and our unreasonable ones. It's a deal I'm gonna make. Back to David. <laughs> Our, our little gimmick thing later. Um, yeah, and so, and by the way, just one thing. If the customer were always right, there wouldn't be Google. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of this. In fact, I used to think, I almost, I guess I'll confess this. I uh, used to write a column for Red Herring. That's not the confession, by the way. But um, I found Google so useful starting around 99, 2000. And I thought, how are they going to make money that I almost contacted Google to offer, I calculated that my gain from Google was about $2,000 a year. And I almost contacted Google to offer to pay them 5% of that annually, because I didn't think they could make money. And, and to even write an article for free on their website telling everyone else why they should do the 5%. So shows what I knew about Google. <laughs> um, so back to the customer always being right. There's a company called Best Buy, I'm sure you always heard of it, you've, you've all heard of it, that realizes the customer is not always right. And in fact, they have divided their customers into what they call angels and devils. <laughs> the angels are the easy to deal with customers. They come in, they get the product, they like it, they're planning to keep it. The devils are people who do things like buy it, bring it back the next day and get a refund, come back the day after that and buy it as an out of the box special of 15% off, you know, that kind of thing. And so they divided their customers into angels and devils for, for 100 of their 671 stores. And when we wrote the book, those 100 stores were doing much better than the other 571. And so the point is the customer is not always right. And that leads to um, a, a, something Charlie wants to talk about. Yeah. So that's a good um, segue into another principle which is that we bring up in the book, which is called Factor 16. Now, many people have heard of or are familiar with Pareto's law. Um, Wilfredo Pareto was an econ Italian economist like 150 years ago who came up with this law of income distribution. And his law said that 20% of the people, a small group, create 80% of the income. And 80% of the people create 20% of the income. Now people in this country these days are worried about income distribution and everything, but as you can see, it's not an American phenomenon, nor a modern one. It goes back to Italy 150 so years ago. Now, as we point out in our book, this applies to a lot more than just distribution of income. And as David mentioned, 
with Best Buy, 20% of their angels, or, or their angels, 20% of their customers, create about 80% of their profits. And on the flip side, 20% of their devils, you know, their customers who are devils, create 80% of their problems. Now, in our book, what we do is we take it to the next logical step, which is if you have this relationship, 20% create 80%, 80% create 20%, we come up with factor 16. These people in this group are 16 times as productive as the people in the 80% group. So let's say you have a, a pharmaceutical product that is sold by a prescription, and you're going to promote it to doctors. Who do you promote it to? You go to the doctors, the really prolific ones, who write 80% of the prescriptions. And there's only 20% of them, so it's easier to get at them. And there were 16 times as much. Am I going to do the next? Um, or, yeah. yeah. OK, now I want to do something that involves you a little more. I'd like two volunteers, and the prize is $5. And it's not one of these phony things where you give it back at the end of the talk. You know, you really get to keep it. So do I have two volunteers? All right. Uh, what's your name? Charles. Charles and? Richard. Richard. OK. So uh, we chose a number in advance. We just, Charlie had this little random generator thing. <laughs> and to choose a number between 1 and 10. And so I'm going to just have Richard go first. And we know the number. Remember you? you okay. okay. We know the number. Uh, what's your guess? And you and the closest one gets the five dollars. Three. Three. Four. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a statistician. <laughs> the, the number. Seven. The number was seven. Now, um, good for him. Okay. The point is that uh, if you hear three. Your best response then should be to choose four because you get everything above four and four. Whereas if you chose, say, something like seven, you know, you'd be, uh, well, seven was it. If you chose something like one, you'd be really way off. If you chose, but what if he had said nine? He would have got it. And we were going to run this experiment a bunch of times, but we, didn't bring that many fives. And also, <laughs> we don't have that much time. So here's the point. He made a good choice. But what if it had been, what if the number had been nine and he said nine? He would have won the five dollars. He would have had a good outcome, but he would not have made a good decision. The good decision is the one you ought to make again and again, not the one you got lucky with. There's this old saying in sports, it's better to be lucky than, than good. No, you should be good and hope for luck. You can't plan on luck. That's why it's called luck. <laughs> and, and so the point is, you've got to distinguish between good decisions that get sometimes bad results and bad decisions that occasionally get good results. That's a very important distinction to make. Do you, do you actually want to show that? Oh, yeah. So we chose, um, actually, since you generated it, do you want yeah. to walk them through it? Yeah, so um, we happen to have an example with, with three as the first number that's picked. So. <laughs> Let's say um, Richard picked, Richard, right? Picked three, which he did, and Charles picked one. Now, there's some probability, 11%, that Charles would still win. Because one out of nine. And he would win, two would be a tie, and then he would lose if it was four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and three, you can't pick it again. So he would lose if it's one, and there, that's one number out of nine, so it's 11%. Two would win if it's two or one. Four would win if it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or four. And, and ten would win if it's seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's four out of nine. So the point here is the highest probability is four, which is what Charles picked, and, and he won. But he could have picked this one. That would have been a very good decision, and he could have lost. There's a 27%, 23% chance he could have lost. Now, he could have picked this one and still won. There's an 11% chance he could have won. So when, you, when people judge decisions based on the outcomes, they're not judging the decisions. They're judging the outcome. And to really know if somebody made a good decision, you need to look at it this way and see what they were deciding between. Right. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Richard, 
let's say you don't, now that we've gone through that, and you don't know it's three, okay, what would you say now as the number? Five or six. Bingo, you got it. <laughs> and then he would have. Yeah. Being the second guy, could I have picked three and pocketed two and a half bucks as a sure thing? Being the second guy. Oh, we didn't make clear, did we? We did not make clear. You hear what he said? Being the second guy, given that, um, that Richard chose three, could I be the second guy and choose three and pocket half of it? We didn't make the rules clear, but I guess it didn't matter. <laughs> no, he's not saying it would have been a good choice. It's just in retrospect. Right. It, it depends. If I need the two and a half bucks, no, you're absolutely right. It does depend on risk. Seems depend on risk. We didn't say the rules, but the rules are you can't pick the same number. But what you could do is agree with him that we'll split it regardless. Yes. Yes. And then you have guaranteed two and a half. Question over there. Should be point seven eight, I think. Yeah. Seven ninths. You only got nine to choose from, so it's seven ninths. Yeah, we, and we should have rounded off. Yeah, this should be 0.78 yeah. and 0.67 and yeah. 0.67. Yeah. Sorry about that. So the allocation. <laughs> okay. Way sharper an audience than the Fortune 500 firm we gave this yeah. to. Well, not that you guys aren't, but the Fortune 500 management we gave it to. Yeah, we gave, we gave this to the management team of this company, and they were just being so obtuse. It's like, <laughs> Dave and I are looking at each other, it's like, where's the hidden cameras? <laughs> Is this like a test or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now who here has a list of to-do items, you know, a honeydew list at home that's just like so long, and you keep doing stuff, and you never get to the bottom? <laughs> right, I mean, I do, it sounds like everybody does. And, and at work, too, the same thing happens at work. You know, I've got this huge long list. I never get to the bottom of it. OK, this is what we call productivity table. And this can help you figure out what to spend your time on. What's most valuable for you to spend your time on? And a couple of ground rules. If your daughter breaks her leg, go to the emergency room. You don't need to do this. If you promise to be in court on Tuesday, go to court on Tuesday. You don't need to do this. And if you're just thinking, should I spend two minutes and check my email, you're, you're just going to check your email anyway. Don't do this. So this is kind of for bigger things. And what we did here is we just kind of put down some things that were on our list. You know, select the best child, the best school for my child, <laughs> <laughs> the best child. I pick you. <laughs> but the value would be higher. <laughs> Um, you know, place ads for an old car, do some tree trimming, you know, fix some, some boards on my deck, things like that. The next column we put how long it's going to take. And then for some of these things, there's a penalty if you don't do it well. So if I don't fix the boards, you know, somebody might trip or fall through and have some kind of a problem. Um, so that would be a penalty. And then there's also rewards. So for example, if, uh, you know, I, I Make, do my investments and, and I get a higher rate of return, you know, there's some reward there. So this is what you put in the table. And then what we do is we look at the, the weighted return, which is just the, the reward basically plus, plus the uh, penalty. And then we divide it by how many hours it's going to take. And even if this is just as far as you get, what you notice is that some of these have way higher value per hour than some of the other ones. So right there, that tells you maybe you should be working on the higher value ones, at least first. But there's one thing we left off here, which is that life is probabilistic. It's not deterministic. So I might not fix the boards on the deck, but I might never have a problem, too. So now we're going to do, to make it a little bit more complicated, so we're going to put some probabilities in. So let's just say I assigned a probability of 50% that somebody's going to trip and hurt themselves. Now you might disagree with these numbers, and that's fine. You put your own numbers in here. These are, these are our numbers. But now what we do, instead of just taking the, the return of the reward plus the probability, we, we take the, the, um, the penalty, the reward and the penalty. We take the probability weighted um, total return. So we multiply the penalty times its probability plus the reward times its probability and get that. 
And then what you see, here's the weighted return, and here's the weighted value per hour. And what you'll notice is there's this huge difference here. So this one, looking at my investments, is worth $2,500 an hour. Who here makes $2,500 an hour? Oh, we thought there'd be a bunch of them. <laughs> so this might be the, the best one to do first, but even the lowest one, which is $25 an hour, that's still a reasonable return, it's one one hundredth as much. So if I'm going to do something, maybe I should do my investments first and then my tree trimming only after I've done the other things. Um, so yeah. So what, what about if you think about security features for your car um, that potentially could save your life, but at a very small change, and knowing that life has probably an infinite um, payback, how would that um, be measured in this, um, in this category? Never use yeah. function. No, I understand, but wouldn't then the, the outcome or expected value would be infinite and the uh, probabilistic would be like zero, 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 one percent ah. still have an infinite... Uh, You're right on the probability. Can I, can I just... Well, we actually cover that exact topic on page 55 in the book. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, but well, want... I just want to say that you're right on the probability, and you're right that if someone, and the experiment I do with my students is I say, I come in with a loaded gun, you know, six chambers, all loaded. I aim it, you know, two, two feet from you. I don't have to be a really good shot. What do I have to pay you to take that shot? And of course, I get the answer, infinity, almost always. Interestingly, a student from a very poor country, I teach military officers, said if, he, if I made it 10 million, he would do it because he'd have that to leave to his very poor kids. Uh, but the typical answer is infinity. And as you say, a finite number times infinity is, is finite. But here's the thing. We're taking a, pro, a small probability of dying. And if we look at the way we behave, we treat those probabilities of dying as finite in the sense that we have to be paid only a finite amount to take them. So economists have looked at what extra wage do people make to take risky jobs. And they can back out of that what we call the value of a statistical life. And then you just would put that number in there and weight it and so on. Well, and that's one answer. Another answer, um, I went to Stanford for grad school and I studied under <laughs> Ron, Ron Howard, not, not the actor, happy days. Um, brilliant guy. But he came up with this concept called micromortars. Now, you would never sell your whole life, well, most people wouldn't, just because you, you wouldn't be able to enjoy the money you got. But we sell little bits of our lives every day. You sold a little bit of your life when you drove here today in your car because there was some risk. And so what a micromort is, is you take um, little tiny increments of risk and you sign a price to it. So a micromort is a one in a one million chance of dying. So now if I buy a safe car or I buy an unsafe car, I'm paying more micromorts to buy the unsafe car and there's a price to that. And let's say you, you put a price of $20 million on your life. Each micromort would be $20. And you can actually calculate if you want to go through it. And we give a little example in the book. That, that, depending on how long you keep that unsafe car, how much you're paying in terms of micromorts versus the more expensive car. <laughs> we have one more. Oh, yeah? It's not related to what you were just talking about. It's related to your slide up here. Yeah. Um, start ranking everything based on the expected value of those. But yeah. as you noted about five minutes ago, you never see the end of these lists. So you get something that's low value, you're never going to get to it. So That's a very, very that's good right. point. And, and you shouldn't. Yeah. So that's your thing is that you shouldn't? You shouldn't. Either you if shouldn't. you're never going to get to it, what's the alternative? You get to it, but you didn't do one of the higher value things. And then, as you say, create other alternatives, hire someone to do it. So I hire a gardener, for example. Yeah. You also got to consider things that have an intangible benefit. Like, I want to spend eight hours and I'm going to go fishing. Right. Because it has you know, some other intangible benefit. And you would just try to come up with some, to, to make this work, you would come up with some monetary value of, of the fishing. You know, what, what's the value? Would, would I pay 500 for the fishing? You know, stuff, something like that. Yeah, I mean, these, these are just values we assign. So like if, if painting your house was up here, you know, how much would you pay right now if somebody just said, ta-da, your house is painted? You know, and that's maybe the, the value you'd put up there. Right. Okay. Um, 
Another principle we'd like to talk about is that biases affect all of us. We're basically all biased. And once we know that, then we can make better decisions because we realize we're biased. And the problem is, is that people form mental models about the world, but our biased perceptions go into those mental models. And so we might build the wrong mental model or come up with the wrong conclusion. So here's an example. <laughs> Years ago, I was talking with a, a female colleague of mine about electronics and computer stores in this area. And she said confidently and unequivocally, I will never again shop at Fry's Electronics. I said, whoa, you know, why not? And she said adamantly, they discriminate against women. And I asked her, well, how do they do that? You know, their employees? And she said, no, the customers. They ignore women shoppers and don't help them. I said, whoa, I had exactly the same experience at Fry's. I mean, I go in there and they never help me. <laughs> so I just assumed that Fry's was trying to save money so they could have really low prices. She, on the other hand, associated herself with a group of people, women, and when she didn't like the experience she had there, she extrapolated to that group of people, women, and she said Fry's doesn't treat women well. Whereas I was thinking Fry's was just trying to save money. That's my turn. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are lots of times when we face bias, and so one of the stories we tell in our book is about a man who kind of was very clever in creating other alternatives to figure out a way around bias. So it goes to our other principle, create better alternatives. There was a black man in the early 1940s in Chicago who wanted to borrow $500 so he could start a magazine aimed at a black audience. And he took his plan to a bank, and it was run by white people. And the guy looked at his plan and said, very good plan. Unfortunately, we can't lend you money. In fact, he was told, quote, Boy, boy, we don't lend money to colored people, unquote. And this man said, but you think it was a good plan, right? He said, oh, yeah. Can you, mention, can you recommend a place that does lend money to black people? And the guy gives him a name and says, oh, and you think it's a good plan? Would you be willing to write a letter to that effect? He says, sure. It's not breaking any of my rules. So he writes a letter. The man goes, gets the loan, starts Negro Digest, goes on, starts Ebony and Jet, and his name is John Johnson. And just because he created an alternative for getting around this bias rather than letting it stop him. Don't, yeah, don't forget he's a billionaire too. Oh yeah, he died as a billionaire uh, a couple of years ago. Now another kind of bias is we tend not to do what we call check your base. So let me give an example. It comes up every year at a certain time of the year when there's a newspaper story about what kind of car, you know, what's, you know, what kind of cars get stolen. And you'll see the list and it's typically got Honda Civics and Honda Accords and stuff like that. And the way it's reported, oh, you know, you better not have a Civic or an Accord, right? But what they're really doing is they're looking at the number of Civics that get stolen, the number of Accords that get stolen, the number of BMWs that get stolen. How many BMWs are there relative to Civics? Way fewer, way fewer. So in other words, what they forgot to do was check their base, to take the numerator, the number stolen, over the base, over the denominator, the number out there. And that's a very different number. I mean, a BMW is much more tempting to steal. Although I'm not sure it's as good a car, but that's another story. <laughs> now, another example of checking your base or not checking your base, and it's a much more serious example, is in the intelligence leading up to the attack on Iraq. This came out in the, uh, in the later uh, look back at what had happened. The US authorities had reason to believe, good reason to believe, that there was this kind of tanker truck. Well, they pretty much knew there was this kind of tanker truck that Saddam Hussein would use to transport chemical weapons. And they had all these aerial satellite photos. And in the few weeks before the invasion, they noticed a dramatic increase in the number of pictures of these tanker trucks. More pictures of tanker trucks. But they didn't check their base. 
Why were there more pictures of tanker trucks? Because the United States was planning an invasion. And if they're planning an invasion, they're going to take more satellite photos. There were more pictures of, of tanker trucks because there were more pictures. <laughs> Another principle which we laid out near the start was think simple. Einstein once said, make a problem as simple as possible, but no simpler. And sometimes you have a problem you're looking at where you've got all these variables, all these things, and it would be very costly to get a lot of the information to solve it and get everything nailed down. Not always, but sometimes you can do what we call use thresholds. You can say, if this certain variable is above x or below x, I know my decision. And Charlie's going to give you an example of that that he used in a consulting project. So here's another project where we provided objective insights, but instead of kicking us out of the boardroom, they were actually very happy with us. So we don't get kicked out of every boardroom. <laughs> um, this was for a, a young, small biotech company, and they developed an HIV AIDS medicine. And this looked to be a, a really good drug. Um, but the thinking within the company was that they're just this little, small company. They don't know what to do with this big drug. So they were going to license it out to the big pharma company that had the huge sales force and the marketing teams and the experience management. And of course, the big pharma company would sell more of this product than the little company would, right? But we said, you know, we'd like to look at this and analyze this. So we wanted to look at the two cases, keep the product or license it. Now, if you keep it, you have to set up the whole marketing organization, sales, all that stuff. It's very expensive. But when you get revenues, you get to keep 100% of it. Now, when you license it out, it's easy. You don't have to set up that stuff. But when you get revenue, when, when the revenues come in, you just get a percentage of it. That's your royalty rate. So we went to the management team. We said, OK, the big pharma company is going to do better than you'll do. How much better? You know, 10%, 50%, give us a number. And they were very uncomfortable giving us, us a number. So we weren't thwarted. What we did is we used thresholds, as David said. And we went back and looked. And we compared the two alternatives and made them equal. How much more would this big pharma company have to sell to, to, just to break even on that decision? Turns out the answer is five. So for every 100 bottles that the little company would sell, the big companies have to sell 500. Now, we took this to the management team, and we told them five, just to break even. If it's less than five, you should keep the product. If it's more than five, you should license it out. And we told them five. Five is the answer. And you could just see their jaws drop. Five? I said, no way it's going to be five. You know, they were thinking maybe 30% or 50% more, but no way, no way would it be five. And so we had set the hurdle rate, and we knew that reality was going to be below that. Um, and so this company did take our advice, and they kept this product. And they've been very, very successful since then. OK. By the way, Adam, how long do we have to go? Because I want to leave a little time for Q&A at the end. Uh, till now. <laughs> oh, till now. Hi. I'm wondering if we should do the airline example versus the closing thing. I'm going to do the closing. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip something. Let me just tell you, if anyone wants to wait around, I don't know if you have time, but we show you this nice little numerical example of how do you decide whether to buy a ticket in advance to go to a meeting, and imagine you're paying for it, not your employer, to, to go to a meeting knowing there's some probability the meeting will be canceled, and we just kind of walk you through how to do that. But I want to end with what we call, it's our last chapter in the book, Do the Right Thing. Um, we've focused so far in our talk and in the book, in the previous X number of chapters, on expanding your alternatives, having more options, you know, do, doing better for yourself. We haven't said a thing yet about ethics, about making good decisions, about making ethical decisions. And now I want to talk about that. And it turns out if you use this same way of thinking that we've applied, you will get to the conclusion that you ought to be pretty ethical. I mean, you ought to be honest, ought not to defraud people, steal from people, murder people, stuff like that. <laughs> and I want to say why. Because offhand, it might not be, I mean, it might be obvious to you because you brought up that way, but it might not be obvious in a very narrow cost benefit sense, and that's what I want to show. 
think about if you f start stealing from people. It seems like you'll expand your alternatives, right? Whatever you had, like you and I are equal. You start stealing, I don't. You have more options because you steal stuff. But here's the problem. As you get found out, your options, your other options actually start shrink shrinking. The example we give in the book is, let's say you decide to be a cannibal. People would start avoiding you, especially around mealtime. <laughs> and as Adam Smith pointed out, in civilized society, he stands at all times in need of the cooperation and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. In other words, we have this incredibly extensive division of labor. Everything you're wearing today, I guarantee you did not produce. We've got this incredibly extensive division of labor that required cooperation from a lot of strangers. You're going to get more cooperation by being more, having a higher reputation, being easier to trust, and so on, because otherwise you get found out. Now, it seems like a famous counterexample is P.T. Barnum, who's famous for having said, there's a sucker born every minute. He didn't say it. In fact, he said about someone else who tried to cheat people, poor soul, not to understand that the hardest way to make money is dishonestly. For that same reason I talked about, your, narrow, your options shrink. And in fact, here's how he made his money. When the circus used to come to town, he ran a circus. When the circus used to come to town, the circus would rob you. They actually had employees out there to rob the crowd and other employees to go to the, where the people in the crowd lived and rob their houses because they're at the circus. And that word got out very widely. And P.T. Barnum said, hey, I got an idea. Create new alternatives. We will guarantee that with our circus, we won't have people robbing your house or you. And we'll even have some plainclothes people looking for the robbers. And that's how his circus did very well. Now. Think about, um, so what we say is, you know, the US Constitution, Constitution Day was last September 17th. I gave a talk on it down in Monterey Peninsula. And I pointed out that the Constitution is a set of things that the government cannot do, and then a very narrow list of things it can do. It's enumerated powers. If it's not on that list, you can't do it. Well, we say that you should have your own Constitution. So instead of we the people, I the person have a list of things you won't do. So if you're tempted, you go back to that. And it's a way of saving on thinking and saving on thinking about temptation. Just, no, I thought that went through when I was really calm and I wasn't as drunk and that woman, you know, that very attractive woman wasn't there and so on. And so I'm going to go back to my rule and I'm not going to do that, right? And so you ought to have your own constitution. And I want to just end with one quick story to kind of the moral of the whole thing. I was a, friend, a teenage fr uh, son of a friend of mine years ago, I live in the Monterey area, was sitting around talking to these other tr teenagers and I was listening in on their conversation. And one of them said, wouldn't it be neat to get a job at Pebble Beach? That's kind of a dream of 17-year-old you know, boys in, in that area. And one of the other guys says, well, as a matter of fact, I have a part-time job at Pebble Beach. And everyone goes, really, really? How'd you get that? And he said, oh. I just went down and applied. <laughs> so our lesson to you, our moral to you is just go down and apply. Thank you. <laughs>